And I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free. There's probably not a person sitting here who hasn't heard those words from Lee Greenwood's anthem, God Bless the USA. I think any American who hears those words has a sense of kind of an emotional reaction, a sense of pride, regardless of what their political affiliation may be. Political leaders have wrapped themselves in those words, even when their normal references to God may not be so respectful or even repeatable. The second paragraph, the Declaration of Independence, tells the world, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Most of us probably don't use the word unalienable very often, but it means it's not transferable to another. It's not something that's capable of being taken away or denied. Those are very powerful words. Probably our history instructors, in telling us about that famous document, perhaps neglected to mention that in its application, uh, that noble document primarily referred to white men who owned property rather than all men, and giving women the right to vote took place 144 years later, 100 years ago this year. As well, truly extending those rights to include all people, all citizens, is still a work in progress. Even so, that document was in many ways the very first effort any human government made to guarantee those rights to all of its citizens. We live in a land that understandably prides itself on liberty. One of our most famous quotes is attributed to Patrick Henry at the Second Virginia Convention at St. John's Church in March of 1775, telling the other delegates, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. We were taught from our earliest forays into the national history that this country was founded by people who were seeking freedom, primarily religious freedom, and that freedom is our most fundamental value. We are taught that we fought wars to prepare to preserve our freedoms, wars to protect us from those who would take our freedoms away. We were taught about the horrors of slavery and the slow, agonizing, unfinished struggle to bring true freedom for oppressed peoples wherever we've extended our national powers. The whole world knows we are the land of the free and the home of the brave. When my wife and I visited the Statue of Liberty a few years ago, just before the feast, it was really moving in many ways, but one of the things that was especially moving was to see people from all over the world wanting to have their picture taken with that statue in the background. Here were people from nations where the dream of freedom and liberty that we enjoy every day is only a dim hope. They made it here. And they wanted one picture of themselves with that unmistakable statue behind them. Maybe they wanted it for themselves. Maybe they wanted to send it back home to their family and friends to give them a hope. It really didn't matter. They made it here. And that picture with that statue told everyone who saw it that they were free. But freedom has always been a rather plastic premise, an ephemeral concept loosely defined by each individual, some noble, some not so noble. For some, rather than the things that we've talked about so far, for some it means the right to ride a motorcycle without a helmet. Sometimes I think maybe you just ought to get a fan to feel the air in your face. For some, it means the right to terminate an unwanted or unexpected pregnancy. For others, it might be the right to view or participate in every form of pornography the human mind is capable of inventing. For some, 
It's the right to own and carry every possible type of weapon wherever and whenever they want without regard to the impact upon others. And according to Chris Christofferson and Fred Foster's famous song, For Some, freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. Over the last few months, freedom has found itself carrying a lot of additional baggage. Personal rights have taken an increased importance for many. After all, if it's my right, no one better try to take it away from me. People who daily yield to government-imposed speed limits, tax laws, licensing requirements, still proclaim they have the right to refuse those various uh, rules on masks or social distancing or whatever health mandates the various governing authorities have put in place. Regardless of how anybody feels about those mandates themselves, a great deal of the backlash that has come about from that has been because of personal beliefs in what our rights and freedoms truly are. Some see in every such restriction a secret plot to take away our legitimate freedoms and enslave us to the politicians or the Illuminati or the military industrial complex or whatever conspiracy is driving social media that day. Others, sometimes even church people, proclaim that it was the American fighting man, the soldiers and sailors who gave us our freedoms. My father was a decorated veteran of World War II. He was shot down over Germany. He was seriously wounded and was a prisoner of war for a period of time. Prior to coming into the church, he was hospitalized three times for post-traumatic stress disorder because of the things that he experienced, some of which were sealed away in a dark corner of his mind and he was never able to tell anybody about them. I have a deep respect for the courage and the self-sacrifice that he showed, as well as those like him who put their lives on the line and those who gave their lives. And while I never would want to be disrespectful of any veteran, their service is something to be honored. I would hope that as Christians we recognize, as my father did, that our freedoms were not given to us by men, but by God, because of the faithfulness of Abraham. To give credit to man for what God has done is a very serious mistake. Now we could very easily spend a lot of time debating each individual's belief about personal liberty. We could agree or disagree about how each of us may see those things and what our conceptions of freedom may actually be. But we are supposed to be a people whose standards are established by something more than human reasoning, emotional songs, and simplistic political slogans. Scripture, God's inspired word, is not silent on the subject of liberty. And what this book says must be our personal foundation for our understanding. So how does God define liberty for the Christian? I think we can begin with the assurance that as a matter of fact, God does indeed promise liberty, true liberty. Jesus Christ told the people of his day, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And those words are as true today as they were 2,000 years ago. But since Christians do not have the liberty to choose a non-biblical view of liberty, we're going to spend a little bit of time today to see what God actually says about this subject. And after that, it becomes the responsibility of each of us to carefully examine our own ideas and make sure they conform with God's. Centuries ago, God inspired the prophet Isaiah to say that God's words, God's thoughts, were higher than ours. They're not the same. And that automatically should tell any of us that when we compare our thoughts and his, we know whose thoughts need to change. Freedom and liberty are not concepts that we should take lightly. As a church, we've recognized that one of the main reasons we have been able to do a work over the last century 
is because we live in a land that offers all of its citizens a level of personal freedom without the government imposing burdensome religious limitations upon us. Many of our brethren who live in other areas of the world don't have such freedom. They're often forced to submit to the limited freedoms available under governments that are plainly hostile. In some nations, even casually discussing the government with a friend can lead to unwelcome visitors in the middle of the night. And far too often, as it was phrased in the Nazi-occupied areas of Europe, people who say the wrong things simply disappear into the night and the fog. When I did a search through the Bible for the words free, freedom, liberty, words that are associated in that way, I found nearly a hundred passages in the New King James Version that talk about it. But interestingly, many of those passages had an additional component that probably would surprise most people, perhaps not you, but most people when they think about the subject would probably be a little surprised. Maybe it shouldn't be surprising, but I think most people would find it that way. So I want to look at a few scriptures very quickly. I'm going to read them quickly, so you may just want to jot them down. You're probably not, I'm not going to give you time to turn to them unless you're just really, really good at that. But uh, you may jot them down. You can just listen and see. If you can tell, what is this other component that we find in the scripture when we read about freedom or liberty? The first one I have is Psalm 119, verse 45. Psalm 119, 45, David wrote, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. In Romans 8 and verse 2, the apostle Paul said, for the law of the spirit and life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. He wrote further in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 39, a wife is bound by the law as long as her husband lives, but if her husband dies, she is at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Two more passages from James, first one, James chapter one and verse 25. He says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. One more. James 2, verse 12, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Now, I would imagine many of you have already picked up very quickly on what the concept is that runs through all of those passages. Four of the verses use the word liberty and one uses the word free. Yet all of them refer to liberty or freedom as being established made possible or limited by law. Many people feel that liberty means the freedom to do whatever they want without interference. But that's not in keeping with what the scriptures actually say. Now, would you like you to turn to the next passage? It's back there close to James. It's in 1 John chapter 3. This is one that we, uh, Mr. Jones continually emphasizes to the FI students. You must memorize this verse. 1 John 3, verse 4. It says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. I know the old King James says sin is the transgression of the law. And the concept is there. That's fine. That's not a bad translation. It's just a different approach to it. The word lawlessness here is in the Greek anomia. Namos means law, and the A in front of that makes it negative. So anomia basically means no law, without law. There is no law. So whoever commits sin commits something, uh, lives as if, in a sense, there is no law. For sin is living without law, living without any constraints in that way. Now, since the passage here says, that last part, sin is or equals lawlessness, let's switch those two words around and read the verse again. Whoever commits lawlessness commits sin. And lawlessness is 
sin. Or whoever lives as if there is no, let's try that again. Whoever lives as if no law limits his actions commits sin. And living without law is sin. So if a person thinks that true liberty means the freedom from laws, from statutes, from regulations, from guiding precepts, then that person ends up sinning and in the process justifying sin for themselves and others. Okay, but how can that be? How can a person be free, but at the same time, he has to be subject to laws? Well, I think we can perhaps begin to answer that by asking a different question. What does divine law do for a believer? Now, the average person, and again, I'm not talking about the average person in this audience, but the average person who has a religious bent, who looks at uh, uh, religion at least occasionally, tends to think that God's laws are burdensome and restrictive. They keep you from doing what you want to do. Many Bible commentaries, as you study through, will say that the law of God was a burden a yoke of bondage, a requirement that was too heavy for man to bear. But Scripture clearly says that God's commandments are not burdensome. You're there in 1 John 3. You may just go across the page or the next page. 1 John 5 in verse 3. 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Okay? If the theologians, the commentary writers, the speakers, the evangelicals say God's law was a burden, but John the apostle said God's commandments are not burdensome, wow, which one should we believe? I think you probably have that one down. We can understand very clearly that what God says is far more important than what people think. Why do they think that? Well, religious people often think of something, for example, as the Sabbath and the holy days as being a terrible burden. Okay, does the Sabbath feel like an unwelcome burden to you? You, you know, you're, you're, every week you just dread sundown coming on Friday. Oh, no, another Sabbath coming. Well, a lot of people think that's the way it is. And most of the people, virtually all the people who think that, have never in their lives kept the Sabbath. So they really have no way to value that. But, okay, that seems to be what they think. Does that square with your experience as a Sabbath keeper? Did you, for example, sit at home a few months ago and think, oh no, we're going to have to keep the feast again? Why does God set this heavy yoke of bondage on us? No, I don't think so. That's not the way any of us approach that. We've appreciated and rejoiced in that. But let's take it from a different perspective. Does the law of the Sabbath force you to not work from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday? Does the fourth commandment somehow block you from doing the laundry or mowing the lawn or doing your marketing from sundown Friday to sundown Saturday? Well, of course not. Doesn't have any way to stop you from doing that. It has no force in that way. Okay, it's not the purpose of that law to physically restrain you. So again, we have to say, but if the law can't stop you from sinning, what's it for? Let's use a physical example, and again, I think it's one any of us can readily understand. If you come to a stop sign, I'm assuming you're in your car, okay, we'll give that as a given. If you're walking, it's probably a little different. But if you're in your car and you come to a stop sign, does the law physically make you stop your car? Does the stop sign force you to stop? Probably only if you hit it. No, that's, that's not, what, it's not there. If the law doesn't stop your vehicle, why do you stop? 
Well, again, it's not the purpose of the stop sign to bring your vehicle to a stop. You must choose to do that. So what's the purpose of the sign? What's the purpose of the traffic law behind the sign? Basically, it is to define for you as a driver what's safe and what isn't. What does that sign mean? It means come to a stop and look both ways before you go on to make sure that it's safe. Is that a burden? Is that a difficult thing? Is that something that we find to be uh, just an unbearable burden? Do you resent traffic signs? Do you sit at a stop sign and think, this is an unreasonable infringement of my liberties. I should be able to drive right through this intersection without slowing down. Let those other people do the stopping. After all, this is America. Uh, probably not. You don't sit there with that. You don't have that attitude or that approach at all. That's not the way you feel. So in other words, the law is there to define for everyone what's safe and what's not. Same thing would apply to speed limits, lines separating the traffic as you travel down the road, all of those things. You have the power to ignore those laws, but doing so endangers you and everybody else on the road. In other words, we all have a responsibility to limit ourselves for the safety of others. Now that same, principle, that same principle applies to God's laws. God defines for us what conduct is safe and what's dangerous. The law doesn't force you to live in a certain way, but we voluntarily submit to God's laws because we're convinced that he knows what's good and what's harmful. Many people don't see anything wrong with lust, but God says it'll harm you, your marriage, your family. Don't do it. Many people think a small lie, we call them white lies, a small lie is unimportant, but God says it's harmful. Don't do it. But wait a minute. We said our understanding of freedom and liberty cannot be based upon human reasoning. So is this illustration just human reasoning? Or is it consistent with Scripture? Let's look at a couple passages in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Now, that's a subject we could spend a lot of time on, but it's the last part of this verse I want to look at. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law tells us what sin is defines it. It's not something somebody else thinks up. We live in a world where we have what's called secular righteousness, where people want to set aside God's law, but they want to determine right and wrong on the basis of their own thinking, okay? This says the law of God gives us the knowledge of what's sin and what isn't. A few pages further on, Romans 7. Romans chapter 7, Paul gives a very specific example of this, and it's a good one that applies to our, our world very much today. Romans 7, verse 7, Paul says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. And he gives an illustration. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law said you shall not covet now, when you stop and consider the advertising that we see today, not all of it, but much of it, is quite honestly designed to appeal to human covetousness. That's the approach. That's what's there. The harm that comes from being a covetous person isn't something you might easily understand on your own. So God defines it for us. And he protects us from harming ourselves by becoming covetous people. Let me use another illustration of this because I think sometimes an analogy can make things clearer for us. I'd like to use the analogy of a bridge, but I have a specific bridge in mind. Outside of Canyon City, Colorado is the Royal Gorge Bridge. The bridge is 955 feet above the Arkansas River, 
The bridge is about a quarter mile long, 18 feet wide, with a solid wooden deck and metal railings on each side. Now, for many years, the Royal Gorge Bridge has been restricted to pedestrian traffic. But this year, because of the need for social distancing, as of May 1st, it was opened up to vehicles driving across the bridge. Um, the average American sedan is about six feet wide. So with an 18-foot span on the bridge, two vehicles can pass each other with a little room to spare. Probably a little tighter than most of us would like, but that's all right. You could, you could do that carefully going across. Um, the railings on the bridge are sturdy, but they were designed for people, not for cars. They certainly wouldn't stop a car from driving off the bridge if it rammed into the rails. Uh, they weren't intended to stop a car. They were intended just to show where the edges are, so you would know where it's safe and where it's not. Suppose you needed to drive across the bridge. Now, I mentioned this at the feast, and a gentleman came up, and he said, you know, that bridge actually goes nowhere. There's nothing out there to see except the bridge. Okay. But suppose you needed to drive across the bridge. It might be a little unnerving, but the rails are there. They show you the edge. You don't intend to hit them, and you know that since they're there, as long as you don't run into them, you can safely drive across the bridge, as thousands of people do. It gives you confidence. It gives you an assurance. I can be safe as long as I'm between the railings. Okay, so let's change the scenario a little bit. You still need to drive across the bridge, but it's night. You don't have any lights in your car and none on the bridge. And uh, you still need to go across the bridge. The bridge is as solid as before. It's still 18 feet wide. And, um, oh, let's add one more thing to it. You have to drive at least 50 miles an hour across the bridge. Okay. How safe do you feel? No lights. No lights in your car, no lights on the bridge. But it's still the same bridge. Rails are still there, you just can't see them. And you've got to drive 50 miles an hour across the bridge. Oh, that would be a little scary. No, it'd be a lot scary. But let's do just one more thing. Let's let God take a hand. And God's going to put some lights to show you where the rails are. Ten lights, actually, to show you where the rails are. The lights can't stop you. Lights don't have the power to do that. They don't fully light up the whole bridge, but they do show you where the edges are. They enable you to see the railings. Do you think if that happened, you'd be able to drive safely across the bridge? I bet most of us would. Because we have something that shows us the boundaries. Those bridge railings limit your freedom to drive where you want to drive. So how do you feel about them? Do you resent them? Do you want to say, I've got my rights and no one can tell me where to drive my own car. This is a free country. No, I don't think so. We're grateful that those lights show us where the rails are. One important factor that sets the believer apart is that you see and trust the lights while the world cannot or will not see them nor trust them. God's law provides the railings for living a safe life. As long as we stay within the parameters that God sets, we're safe, we're happy. And when we go outside of those parameters, or when we think that we know better than he does, where the boundaries ought to be, tragedy comes. Godly freedom, the kind of freedom Jesus promised, exists only inside of those boundaries. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to that. But a few moments ago, we also used another relevant word. The word was submit. You see, when, say for example, since we've used 
driving and traffic as an example. When we obtain a valid driver's license, we agree to submit to the traffic laws where we are. Because of God's kindness and the feast, we've had the opportunity to travel in several places around the world. I think especially Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, where all those folks drive on the left-hand side of the road. We have a rule in our family that when we're in a place like that, my wife sits in the passenger seat uh, and I do the driving. And overall, I've done pretty well. I mean, there were a few incidents of frightening pedestrians and uh, I also had the problem, which some of you will understand, of turning on the windshield wipers every time I wanted to turn. But other than that, we've done fairly well. But I can't exercise my rights in a way that's going to endanger somebody else. I've got to submit to those laws when I'm in their area. Now, we all know that Scripture tells wives they are to submit to their own husbands. Why? Why are wives submissive to their own husbands? Is it because men are intrinsically superior to women? I could show you some commentaries that say that, but they're really old commentaries, and the people who wrote them are dead. We won't say why. They're just gone. No, that isn't the reason why we're told this. God says that for her to submit to her own husband is the right choice to make in order for the family that God designed and created to function properly. It's a choice each individual wife continually makes based upon God's standards. Okay, are wives the only people who are required to submit? Does God have kind of a double standard where women have to learn submission, but men don't? Well, let's consider another scripture that's frequently used in this way. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Now, many of you will know Ephesians 5 talks about the marriage relationship, among other things. And that's fine. I want to get to just a very short verse and talk about it. Ephesians 5, verse 21, that simply says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, I've heard people try to explain this verse by saying that there are times when the wife submits to her husband and does things his way, and there are other times when the husband submits to his wife and does things her way. That is totally incorrect. And it's not what this verse says. Should a husband consider his wife's wishes and do things the way she would like them to be done when it's possible? Of course he should. That's not even a question. But that is not submission. That is leadership. Leadership is not doing what you want to do. It is finding the best way and having the humility to lead people there even when it's not what you wanted to do. A godly husband hears his wife's preferences. He carefully considers them and then he decides how the family's going to proceed. He is still the head of the family. He is still responsible for making and implementing the decisions and he does so after considering her wise counsel because it is her wise counsel that enables him to make better decisions. Maybe this concept would be a little clearer if we take it one more level. As a parent, have you ever done something you really didn't want to do, but you did it because it was important to your children? Of course you have. Any parent has. you are willing to give up what you might like to do in order to show your love for your children. Did you submit to your children at that point? Did you relinquish your role as the parent in doing that? No. You were still the parents. You determined what would be done and when. 
Likewise, when a husband solicits and receives his wife's input and then decides to do it the way she wishes, he hasn't submitted to his wife. He has led his family as he is required to by God. So what did Paul mean when he wrote this statement that we are to be submitting to one another in the fear of God? Well, the context shows us that there are times when all of us must voluntarily submit to someone else. Here at services, we all voluntarily submit to the guidance of others, our pastor, the ushers, the requirements of the state or of the facility. On some occasions, you may be the one making the decisions and others are to submit to you. On other occasions, those who are submitting today may be the ones who are in charge and you submit to them. So yeah, we all submit to one another in different situations. If we can't willingly submit to those who are in authority, then Jesus Christ will never be able to give us any authority. In the immediate context of the family, Paul shows that every husband is expected to submit to the headship of Jesus Christ. I think it's fascinating to notice that there is never a scripture anywhere which tells a husband to make his wife submit. Submission is always a choice that must be made by each individual. And this passage tells us that there are times when all of us must make that choice. Some people place a great deal of emphasis on being independent. Christians should recognize that that in fact was Satan's attitude. In fact, when you look at the fruit of the Spirit of God listed in Galatians 5, you won't find independence there anywhere. In fact, there is only one place in the Bible where you will find the word independent. It's in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 11. And what it shows is that men and women are neither one independent of the other, but we are in fact interdependent. And that's the only time we find that. When it comes to godly submission, I'm not your judge, and you're not mine. But neither one of us dare come to the conclusion that we don't have a judge. 1 Peter 4.17 says, Judgment is now upon the household of God. And learning to be properly submissive is an important part of learning to fear God in the proper way. And we could go to many other scriptures, which I won't take the time for now, that remind us that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom. So it's a very important thing to learn. The gospel message we proclaim is, in fact, a message of liberty. True godly liberty, not a deceptive, counterfeit, satanic independence but it's a liberty that's based upon and defined by God's law. Consider a couple more scriptures rather quickly. The first recorded sermon we have of Jesus Christ was given in the synagogue in Nazareth. Luke records it in Luke chapter 4. And in the process of talking about that, Jesus Christ quoted from the book of Isaiah. I want to read the passage from Luke 4, starting in verse 18. Here's what Jesus Christ said at the beginning of his ministry. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus Christ clearly said from the beginning of his ministry that his gospel message was a message of liberty, godly liberty. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul also makes a very important comment about liberty. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17, Paul says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. 
What does that have to do with law? Well, I won't turn there, but you might put in your notes Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, where he clearly says that he gives his spirit to those who obey him. So yeah, law is still there. Okay. So does that wrap it up? Is that the conclusion of the matter? Is law the final determining factor for us to consider when we want to understand and live in godly freedom? True godly freedom means submitting to God's law, and as long as we're within the boundaries of God's law, we're free to do whatever we want, right? Actually, no. There's more. And this may be where some who profess Christianity are missing the mark. We don't have time to go through the whole section, but the Apostle Paul had to explain this issue for the brethren in Corinth. The catalyst for the discussion was a question that they had sent to him and which he begins to address in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. You can turn there because that's where I want to begin. The question involved was about whether it was all right for a Christian to eat food that had been sacrificed to an idol. Now, oftentimes we look at that and we think, well, what's that have to do with me today? Well, I hope you'll see in a moment that it has everything to do with you today. The first verse of this section actually hints at a very important consideration. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1, Paul wrote, now, concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. We all know that the idols are nothing. I mean, that was one of the Hebrew words that was used. Literally, the word means the nothings. Yeah, we know that. We know there are no other gods. We know that that, that doesn't exist. So, yeah, we have that knowledge. But then he says something unusual. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies or builds up. Hmm. What does he mean by that? Is there something more than knowledge? Biblical knowledge said there were no other gods. The idols had no power to affect the food, and therefore eating food offered to idols was not an issue. Except it was an issue. It was a problem. Because knowledge led people in a couple different directions. So twice the Apostle Paul gives a very important principle he first gives it in chapter 6 and verse 12, and again in chapter 10. I want to read the passage in chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 23. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. He says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify." Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. Now, we have long understood that when Paul said, all things are lawful for me, he was not saying murder, adultery, stealing, idolatry, those things were lawful. Obviously, that isn't what he meant. He was specifically saying that whatever God declares to be lawful, whatever fits between the rails, would be lawful for him to do. But then he adds that qualifier. Not all things build up. Not all things edify. Hmm. How do we apply that? One of the great blessings that I find from being able to teach the epistles of Paul is to realize over a period of time how little I really know and how much there is to learn. And I will say that it has taken me years to pick this up but I finally realized a core issue that goes through the entirety of the book of 1 Corinthians. I hadn't really recognized it until a couple of years ago. It is this principle. All things may be lawful, but not all things build up. So I want to consider that as we look at the book for a moment. Now, I'm, I'm not going to turn to a bunch of scriptures. I'm going to assume that you have certain knowledge about what the book contains. In the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, there is an issue that comes up 
where people are choosing their favorite, um, shall I say, their favorite minister? I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I am of Jesus Christ. Okay. Is there a law that says you can't have a favorite minister? No. But what was taking place there was mine's better than yours. And I'll listen to mine and I won't listen to yours. So it was lawful to have a favorite, but the way they were doing it was not building the church, it was dividing the church. Last week, Mr. Burnett referred to chapter 3. It talks about building on the foundation. We all have the same foundation. Jesus Christ is that foundation. But you can build with gold and silver and precious stones or wood or hay or stubble. And when the trials come along, those things that are good are going to survive and those that aren't are not. Okay. Is there a law against building on the foundation with wood, hay, and stubble? No. There's no law so you can't do that. It's not wise. It's not a good thing to do. To make your Christianity build on that foundation of Jesus Christ, things that really are kind of fringy and unimportant, you know, your chronology of Christ's return or some of those things that people get. I remember the one a number of years ago, you shouldn't eat mushrooms because they don't have seeds. I mean, okay. Um, I don't know any law that requires you to eat mushrooms, but uh, is that really the kind of thing that you want to build your Christianity on? As you move into chapter 5, we find the famous story of the individual who is involved in a blatant sexual sin, and the church is doing nothing about it. Is it wrong to be patient with someone who is struggling with a sin? No, it's not wrong. You want to be patient. But what was going on in Corinth wasn't building up the sinner or the congregation. It was tearing down. So there was no law that says you cannot be patient. But being patient in this case was not building up. You come to chapter 6 and people are taking one another to court over civil cases. Is there a scripture you can quote that says, thou shalt not take your brother to court over a civil case? No. But it sure does tear apart the church. It doesn't build up. There's not a law against it, but there sure is a lot of principle against it. You come to chapter 7. Chapter 7 is about marriage. The relationships that begin there. You notice how it begins? You wives don't belong to yourselves. You belong to your husband. You husbands don't belong to yourselves. You belong to your wife. Okay, we've established our rights. But does exercising your rights in marriage make a really good marriage? Are there other things that maybe we need to consider? Oh, you may, there may not be a law against it, but what builds up? What strengthens? You then come to chapters 8, 9, 10 that talk about this food offered to idols. And it confused me for years. I will say I admit it did because chapter 8 basically seems to say, yeah, it's okay, go ahead. And then chapter 10 says, no, you shouldn't do it. And I struggled with that one until I worked my way through it and realized Paul is giving this principle all the way through there. He gives several interesting examples along the way. He talks about being supported in his work as a minister from the the tithes and offerings of the people. And basically what he told the people in Corinth is, I have the right. I have the right to be supported. But I'm not exercising that right with you because I know how you are about money. So it's my right. But if I exercise that right, it wouldn't build up. It would divide. It would hurt. And you can go on through the rest of the book. Chapter 11 talks about how the brethren were getting together for the Passover. And before the Passover service, as we think of it, they were having a meal. But the way they were conducting themselves at that meal, some were drunk, some were overeating, some had nothing. The meal was dividing the church. Was it somehow sinful to have the meal? No, 
but what they were doing didn't build up. So there was more, and you could go on through the rest of the book. Now, Paul illustrated how he applied that principle in dealing with others in chapter 9. Let's just notice a few verses here. 1 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 19. He says, for though I'm free from all men, nobody has the right to tell me what I have to do. I'm free from men's ideas. I've made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win Jews. Was Paul being deceptive there? No. Paul understood what, how being Jewish affected your outlook toward God, toward how you're supposed to live. He said, I understood that. So when I go to those people, I meet them where they are. I talk to them in that way. I, I understand that. I don't have to maintain being a Jew for all eternity. No, that's not what God requires. But there's nothing wrong with being Jewish. So yes, I, I became that way. To those who are under the law, as under the law. Now, the phrase under the law is something that we have correctly understood through the years as a phrase that refers to an individual who is still under the penalty of sin. Under the law does not mean somebody who has to obey the law. We all have to obey the law. That's different. But those who are under the law, I mean, they're still under the penalty. They still have that death penalty hanging over them. And Paul said, I became like them. I know what it's like to carry through life this burden of guilt. Uh, so I approached them from that point. I, I understood that. As under the law that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now let's notice just a couple of things here about verses 20 and 21. In verse 20, Paul said he had approached those under the law those who had not yet received forgiveness for their sin, as if he had not received it either. He wasn't being deceptive. He was saying he understood what it feels like to be under the condemnation of sin. So he understood how they felt. In verse 21, he said he approached those who lived as if there were no law with the same sense of understanding. In other words, he knew it wasn't helpful to approach someone who fails to recognize the validity of God's law by shoving God's law in their face. That's not a good way to reach them. So instead, he reasoned with them by beginning where they were. But I want to notice one other thing. It's an important point, and the English translation doesn't really show it very well. In that parenthetical expression there, where he said, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ. In verse 20, the word under, when we talk about being under the penalty of the law, is the Greek word hupo, which means under or beneath. That's a perfectly good translation. But in verse 21, he used a different word. The preposition in verse 21, it's translated under, is the Greek preposition eis, E-I-S. And it means inside of or within. So the expression under law toward Christ meant he stayed within the boundaries of the law. Even when reaching out to those who didn't acknowledge the need for law. In other words... He said he never stepped outside of God's law. He was always between the railings. When you're crossing the bridge, you're safe as long as you stay between the railings. But you also have to consider the others who are also on the bridge. Some may walk closer to one railing or the other than you think is wise, but they're still on the bridge. Some may walk from one side to the other and yet never cross over the railings. Some may move faster or slower than you. 
Some may stand in your way, so you can't walk in exactly the path or the speed you wanted to. But you don't have the freedom to trip them or walk over them or knock them off the bridge so that you can walk wherever you want. The railings are vital, but they're not the whole story. I don't often quote from a pope, but John Paul II actually expressed this concept very well. Here's what he said. Love consists of a commitment which limits one's freedom. It is giving of the self, and to give oneself means just that, to limit one's freedom on behalf of another. Yeah, that's what Christian love means. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Let's wrap this up today by looking briefly at three passages. They're short. 1 Peter 2 and verse 16. I'm breaking into the thought here, but Peter writes, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. The old King James says, not using liberty as a cloak for maliciousness. In other words, I'm not to use my liberty as an excuse to disregard other people. Galatians 5, verse 13. Galatians 5, verse 13. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. And finally, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 3. Paul wrote to the brethren in Philippi, and, and when you consider it, Philippi was a congregation that Paul was especially close to. He gives very little correction to the Philippian church. So he's trying to be very encouraging. He says this, starting in verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let me read that verse from the New English translation. Instead of being motivated by selfish ambition or vanity, each of you should, in humility, be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. Continuing on in verse 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. And I'm grateful to be called a Christian, where at least I know what godly liberty really means.